Good morning and good afternoon to all our participants and welcome back to our IAFA 2022 webinar. Yesterday, we put the spotlight on small-scale aquaculture. Today, the focus of our webinar is on small-scale fisheries. Before we start, let me call on Sherlene Antonisami, Director of InfoFish, to introduce our awesome speakers and resource persons. Over to you, Sherlene. Thank you, Susanna, and welcome everyone. Just to quickly give us a, a brief guideline today to ensure we have a smooth session. Uh, this is to inform everyone that this meeting is being recorded and you'll be able to watch uh, the uh, recording of the meeting as well. If you're not able to stay throughout the meeting uh, via InfoFish YouTube channel. Uh, this uh, session is also being streamed live on YouTube channel right now. And uh, if you have, if you like to have your uh, colleagues and your network know about this, please feel to feel, feel to let them know uh, that they can watch this session live as well. Uh, in order to take any questions from the participants, uh, we will please use the Q&A tab that you see at the bottom of your screen for any questions to be directed to the uh, speakers. And uh, I'd like to now move on and introduce to you our awesome list of panelists today and to give us the um, welcome note from the FAO uh, office in the Bangkok, the regional office in Bangkok. We have Dr. Simon Fun Smith, who's the senior fishery officer at the um, Asia Pacific Regional Office for U UN FAO in Bangkok. Uh, Dr. Simon's uh, responsibility lies in coordinating FAO's regional program on fisheries and aquaculture and covers the evaluation and assessment of the role and importance of regional capture fisheries and aquaculture. Dr. Simon also acts as a secretary of the regional fishery body, the Asia Pacific Fishery Commission, EPFIC. Next, we have with us Mr. Sebastian Matthew, who will deliver the opening remarks today. Mr. Sebastian is a member of the EFR International collective in support of fish workers organization. He has been engaging in international processes for nearly three decades related to small scale fisheries in the developing world. Uh, as he represents ICSF and in partnership with the civil society organizations, he has also engaged with several negotiations at the UN FAO uh, as, well, as well as with the international labor organization towards recognition of small scale artisanal pearl fishes and fish workers in the international instruments. And we also have with us uh, Dr. Habibur Rahman Kondakar, who is a fisheries consultant. And uh, Dr. Kondakar has been um, instrumental in preparing a video that we will all be able to share a see later on of, uh, of a small scale fish worker in Bangladesh. Dr. Habibur uh, was in, in the past working with the Department of Fisheries in Bangladesh for more than 35 years. And he's now retired and in his capacity, he, has, uh, he was associated with fisheries and aquaculture development projects aided by various international organizations such as FAO, UNDP, World Bank, ADB and i Next, we have with us Mr. Rafael Ramascal, who is the Chief of Capture Fisheries Division of the Bureau of Fisheries and Aqu Aquatic Resources in the Philippines. Uh, Mr. Ramaskal will give us a few about the fisheries in the Philippines, and uh, he is also in the lead and focal point uh, in formulation and approval of the um, fisheries administrative order of the fisheries management areas in the Philippines. And uh, we also have with us Ms. Nicole Franz, who is based in Rome, FAO Rome. And uh, Ms. Nicole's work focuses on small scale fisheries policies and socioeconomic issues. And since 2021, she leads the Equitable Livelihoods team in the FAO division. Prior to joining FAO, she has worked for the OECD Fisheries Policies Division in Paris, and also was a consultant for the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD. Last but not least, we have with our colleague from CIFDEC, Ms. Paninat Wirawat, uh, who is with the training division in CIFDEC and holds a master's in science uh, degree in ecological marine management from the University of Brussels, Belgium. So 
Welcome to all our esteemed panelists, and uh, I'd like to hand the floor back to Susanna. Over to you. Thank you, Charlene. So let us start uh, our webinar by calling on Simon Van Schmidt to give his welcome remarks. Simon, you have the floor. Thank you, Susanna, and uh, thank you, Charlene, also for the generous introduction. Dear participants of the webinar, on behalf of FAO, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar that is the second part of our regional awareness raising on the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, or IAFA 2022. Yesterday, we had a showcase of the importance and diversity of artisanal aquaculture in the Asia region. And today we'll be focusing on artisanal or small scale fisheries. For those of you who didn't join us yesterday, the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 22 is a celebration of these two subsectors and is intended to raise awareness about their potential, their contributions and values, which are often hidden of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture within the region for us today, but also around the world. FAO, as the lead UN agency for celebrating IAFA 2022, is collaborating with a range of other relevant national and regional organizations, as well as bodies of the United Nations, in rolling out activities for IAFA 2022. So these webinars are part of this overall program that's going on around the world as we speak. The vision of IAFA 2022 is a world in which small scale artisanal fishers, fish farmers and fish workers are fully recognized and empowered to continue their contributions to human well-being, healthy food systems and poverty eradication through the responsible and sustainable use of fisheries and aquaculture resources. There's a strong linkage between this vision and the FAO voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty eradication also known as the SSF guidelines. This uh, instrument sets out a rights-based rights -based framework for supporting the small-scale fishery sector. And it also provides guidance on how we can seek to secure these results so that we can contribute towards the targets of the Sustainable Development Goal 14b to promote access by artisanal small-scale fisheries to marine resources and markets. Alongside these instruments for fisheries, there are also similar and needs for the inclusion and development of artisanal and small-scale aquaculture, ensuring their sustainability and ability to access markets and livelihoods. So I hope that you find this webinar informative and perhaps even eye-opening. And I'd like to conclude by thanking InfoFish for helping us organize this and also our speakers and panelists today. And I invite all of you to respond and support the call of IAFA 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Now I would like to call on Sebastian Matthew to deliver his opening remarks. Uh, uh, Sebastian, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Sustina. Uh, thank you, Charlene, and thank you, Simon. Uh, can you share my screen, please? Yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting uh, us to uh, give these uh, open, opening remarks. So I think uh, uh, at the outset, I would like to uh, observe that uh, when you use the term artisanal uh, fisheries, I think it's very, very interesting because there we are actually recognizing uh, the fact that uh, we are talking about people who are skilled, uh, in utilizing uh, traditional uh, small scale or non mechanized methods or techniques for fishing. And uh, these can be uh, in the realms of inland fisheries, uh, coastal fisheries, or marine fisheries. And then uh, we are also recognizing uh, fish processing, uh, making products, especially uh, associated with uh, pre industrial production. So we are, we are trying to trace a culture and history back. Uh, to time immemorial, so to speak. So I think the UN uh, General Assembly Resolution uh, 72 slash 72 is actually aware of this, uh, these dimensions. So therefore, I think what we are trying to do is uh, maybe for the first time in the history of uh, the United Nations, we are celebrating artisanal fisheries. 
and we are trying to extol the virtues of artisanal fishers and fish workers. We are trying to celebrate their skills, uh, techniques, uh, production and processing methods uh, embedded in a time-honored culture. And uh, we are trying to recognize their uh, continued relevance in the context of uh, uh, food security, uh, poverty eradication, and uh, cultural heritage. And then uh, to celebrate uh, alone is not sufficient. Uh, we also have to think of uh, creating an enabling environment to protect their human rights. Because uh, uh, as the title of uh, this uh, uh, International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, so we see a role for both artisanal fisheries and aquaculture. It's not that one will replace the other, both will coexist. And we have to find what kind of a symbiotic relationship can be established. And that perhaps can be done uh, through adopting a human rights-based approach, which Simon also referred to in his uh, introductory remarks. And then uh, uh, when you go into uh, the enabling environment, I think uh, it's very important that we raise public awareness about uh, the elements I mentioned earlier, the cultural, the culture, the traditional indigenous and local ecological knowledge of artisanal fishers and fish workers, about their fishing gears and methods, their boat making, uh, gear setting and fish processing techniques, the ways of uh, conserving and equitably sharing fishery resources through collective action. Im important that these things are celebrated and that we create an, an enabling environment for that. So I think this is a very good opportunity for governments uh, in the, in the uh, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, especially uh, con considering that this is the largest uh, kind of uh, small scale fisheries in, in the world to demonstrate how they are addressing the concerns, uh, especially of the uh, vulnerable and marginalized fishers and fish workers uh, through uh, legal empowerment. Because without legal empowerment, uh, you, you will, they will get more and more marginalized by protecting their right to land, water and fishery resources and protecting the right to decent work and providing social development and social protection. So this is uh, the, the, the uh, uh, sum total of measures which I think government should adopt uh, to secure small scale fisheries, artisanal fisheries in the region. And then it is an occasion also for governments to share their plants uh, for greater uh, pandemic preparedness because we know that we are through a COVID-19 and we, we might uh, face similar pandemics in the future and to address uh, threats facing inland and marine small scale fisheries from the impacts of uh, climate change and extreme weather events, which are again, um, uh, many uh, threats are happening, especially in the Asian region. And then uh, most importantly, we have to create a safeguard and strengthen uh, relevant institutions of governance in consultation with and participation of uh, civil society organizations. Simon mentioned the small scale fisheries guidelines, and I would say the cornerstone of the guideline is this consultation and participation principle. I think this should be adopted. And we need to also move towards looking for intersectoral uh, uh, collaboration because there are many departments and ministries that are involved in, uh, in the issues related to small scale fisheries. And we need interagency collaboration. We need to uh, also think in terms of uh, where we can uh, adopt decentralization and devolution. So where communities can manage their own resources, where the communities can have to share responsibility with the governments and where the state uh, has to be more, uh, uh, more forthcoming and proactive in resource management and other aspects. So therefore we need to see at what level we need to uh, think uh, what kind of interventions are required to make sure that uh, the enabling environment is secure. And then uh, last but not the least, I think uh, uh, adopting uh, relevant instruments as highlighted in the global action plan. I think uh, that yesterday it was referred to in detail. Uh, you can see it on the FAO website of EFR. Uh, there is certainly the way forward uh, towards having an enabling environment to promote and protect uh, artisanal and small scale fisheries, especially to realize the, its potential because the potential of small scale fisheries, the way we see it, is that it is carbon friendly, it is uh, equitable and sustainable. So these are the three attributes which we need to celebrate and, uh, and to take forward uh, to make sure that these attributes are protected in the realms of food production, employment, income and livelihoods so that the uh, present and uh, future generations can benefit. So I think IAFA 2022 is an excellent opportunity to 
take stock of uh, all these elements and to make plans in our legislation policies and uh, programs and schemes to uh, see how small scale uh, artisanal small scale fisheries and uh, artisanal aquaculture can work together for uh, uh, the common uh, benefit of humanity. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, uh, for those enlightening remarks and actually yours and Simon's uh, opening um, complement each other and actually provide the tone for our webinar today. So let us move on and watch a video about women's resilience in small scale fisheries in Bangladesh. And I would like to call on uh, Dr. Habibur to give brief introduction about the video. Uh, Dr. Habibur, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shushana, Charlene, and uh, other panelists, Simon and uh, Sebastian. Welcome you all, the participants and viewers attending in the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022 webinars. During the survey I have conducted for resilience and seizing opportunities, a small scale fisheries and aquaculture business that thrived during the COVID-19 pandemic in South and Southwest Asia, mainly for Bangladesh. We find Mrs. Majeda Begum, aged around 40 years at village, uh, remote village Amuldanga in Tala in Shatkira district in Bangladesh. It is located in the Southwestern part of Bangladesh in the coastal area. The area is frequently faced natural calamities like uh, water logging, cyclone, tidal boats. Majeda Begum is a vendor for both fresh and marine water fish marketing. Most of the fishers are grown in a small aquaculture the, uh, and system and marketed at local fish landing or wholesale auction market. Before death of her husband, Majeda's husband, she was a simple housewife. From 2011, she had chosen the business after her husband's death, which was her husband's business earlier. She was from a Muslim conservative community family. In that locality where she lives, it's hardly to find Muslim women are working outside home state, but women working from other communities is uh, noticeable. <clears throat> During COVID-19 pandemic, there were several lockdown period in 2020 and 21. Even when we make the survey, there was a movement restriction and regulation on normal life and livelihood. During the survey, we find her engaged in marketing fish in a restricted market and supply fish in local houses and customers. She has started using mobile phone in her business. During the pandemic, many workers from different industries and organizations were jobless or uh, earning were less at that time. Mr. Uh, Ms. Majeda Begum and a few other men survive with their business with innovative business ideas. She ensured about the scale, about the sale and uh, demand of fish species um, on that area. She has uh, one son and one daughter. Son is helping her in the business and schooling now she is skilling and the daughter got married after completion her school. She has three members in her family. Her business is directly or indirectly linked with the small scale fish farmer wholesale market. Uh, ensuring consumers requirement during COVID-19 pandemic period. All this encouraged us to write a case study on her Finally, InfoFish director, uh, Charlene, inspired me to prepare a video on Majeda's business and daily engagement. I hope the video on women's resilience in small scale fisheries Bangladesh highlighted excellent livelihood activities and living of Ms. Majeda Begum will give you an idea on a small scale fisheries trade, aquaculture in rural villages of Bangladesh. Finally, wish you all success in, and finally, I 
wish all success of International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022. Thank you all. I invite you to watch the video. Thanks. We are going to visit Satkhira district, which is one of the 64 districts of Bangladesh. And we are going to visit Tala Upazala, which is a sub-district, is located near Sundarban. Sundarban is about 60 miles from this point. And we are going to visit Ms. Majada Begum. She is doing her business in the village, Shimanto Kati. Ms. Majada Begum, who is 39 years old, she is a vendor for freshwater fish marketing. But earlier, before the death of her husband, she was a simple housewife. From 2011, she was choosing the business after her husband's death, which was his traditional business. Currently, she sells fresh fish with her 12 years old son around the week. Her son was only one year old when she took over the business of her husband. She was 26 to 27 year old when she became a widow. After the death of her husband, her family members and her parents advised her to get second marriage, but she denied. She took the challenge of staying alone with her only son and grow him as an educated man in the society. She faced a lot of criticism from her family and neighbor on her living alone without a husband. She faced all the hurdles of living a woman alone without a man. Her son is now growing, schooling and helping his mother in her business.
কি নাম তোমার ইমামুল দুইজনে আপনারা সকাল কয়টা থেকে ব্যবসা এই মাছ শুরু করেছেন ব্যবসা এখন শেষ 10টা এখন মাছ মতো শেষ আপনার শুধু এই চিংড়ি ওদিকে দেখেন এই চিংড়ি এটুক আছে না সকালে <laughs> <laughs> আপনি ভালো আছেন আমরা তো আপনার দেখে আসলাম আপনার মাছের ব্যবসা করে আসলেন ই করলেন সব বিক্রি হয়েছে বাকি আছে না মার্শাল্লাহ আজকে কি লাভ হবে কিছু আল্লাহ দিলে হবে আচ্ছা লকডাউন ছিল আমদানি খরিদার আসতো না সকালে কাটা পরে শোধ করে দিতে টাকা ঠিক আছে আপনার ভালো থাকেন সবাই আপনার ভালো থাকেন for your kind attention and watching listening a, a story of a poor woman from Bangladesh who is uh, surviving with uh, several hurdles thank you all thank you thank you very much the video is like a day in the life of uh, majeda begum and we hope um uh, Uh, it showed you the uh, the realities of what uh, fish traders and fish vendors are are facing daily like what uh, Majeda uh, faced so let us continue now i would like to call on rafael ramiscal to tell us why we should celebrate iafa 2022 rafi you have the floor uh facilitator mom mom susana uh thank you uh uh infofish and fao for uh, uh inviting us to uh to be part of the celebration of the international year of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture so my uh, task is uh, uh basically uh, uh presenting to you what is happening in uh, in the small scale fisheries sector of the philippines and uh why we are going far we, we are celebrating uh we the uh, this uh, uh for this sector um uh the the outline of my presentation will just be uh, a, a brief uh, in terms of how we define artisanal fisheries international and uh, local at the lo- national level and we'll be uh, uh describing the sectors of the fisheries in the philippines and the status of 
the uh, small scale fisher folk and the challenges and concerns of this sector and the government initiatives, as well as uh, a bit of conclusion at the end of the presentation. Uh, just a little to just provide a, a bit of context on how uh, artisanal fisheries and small fisheries is, uh, is uh, uh, defined in, in the international, according to FAO, it's basically traditional, uh, just the traditional fisheries, uh, just like uh, 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 Sebastian was, uh, was describing a while, a while ago, these are the fisheries, simple, uh, relatively small, and uh, small scale as well. So we are basically celebrating this being them being the traditional and small scale and having uh, their uh, uh, important role in providing fish and uh, uh, food to uh, to communities and uh, and peoples uh, again uh, just to uh, emphasize at the at the uh, uh, international level around uh, uh, their contribution around 90 percent of the uh, uh, in terms of the number of the fishers, uh, you will see later in the Philippines as well, this reflects the same. Uh, the annual catch is similar to commercial or industrial fisheries, and this forms about a quarter of the cuts of the world cuts. And uh, as I was saying, this is the perspective of the Philippines if, when it comes to artisanal and small scale fisheries. We sometimes uh, uh, interchangeably use these terms, artisanal, small scale, and municipal. These are basically the terms that we, uh, to us, they are all the same. Uh, this is according to our legal framework. Uh, if you look at the uh, amended fisheries code, municipal fishing refers to fishing using three gross tons or smaller vessels. Uh, whether you are using uh, three gross tons small vessels or without the use of, of any fishing vessel. And the fisher folk, municipal fisher folk are those who are directly engaged. Uh, or indirectly engaged in municipal fishing and related activities. Uh, artisanal, uh, we also in our uh, uh, Republic Act uh, 8425, it's Social Reform and Poverty Alleviation Act. Uh, it uh, defines artisanal fisher folk as being municipal, small scale, and subsistence. So, and who use fishing gear that does not require boats and which only require boats below 30 degrees. So basically, uh, those are the considerations when we say uh, artisanal, small scale, or municipal fisheries in the Philippines. So uh, just a, a quick look in the Philippine fisheries, uh, just to note that the Philippines is eighth in total fisheries production in the world, and uh, in terms of uh, fourth in seabeds production. That's uh, uh, Again, just to emphasize the fisheries uh, sectors that I was uh, mentioning earlier on municipal fishing. These are the uh, uh, this is the sector where fishing is done by three gross tons or less, or without the use of of, of uh, vessel or fishing boats. Commercial fishing. These are the bigger boats, 3.1 and above, uh, and uh, sub uh, categorized into small scale commercial. That's those that are uh, 3.1 to 20 gross tons, medium scale, those, those are 20.1 to 150 gross tons, and the large scale, uh, more than 150 gross tons, and of course, the aquaculture. Uh, just to look at how, what is the structure of our municipal or small scale or sustain, uh, uh, artisanal. Um, if you look at, we have the uh, Fisher Folk registration, this is a re national registry for uh, municipal fisher folk in the Philippines. And as of date, uh, as of yesterday, uh, we had a total of 2.26 uh, million uh, registered municipal fisher folk, of which more than 50% are those uh, engaged in capture fisheries. The rest are uh, the other activities uh, considered as small or sustenance. And uh, in terms of the uh, uh, composition of the boats, 3.3 uh, gross tons and below, 65% uh, unmotorized and 35% are non-motorized. And uh, as of yesterday, uh, those that are registered in our uh, boat register registry is around uh, 271, almost 272,000 uh, fishing boats or bankas, uh, the traditional bankas that uh, we. Uh, in terms of uh, of the uh, contribution of the sec the subsectors and fisheries, as you can see here. In terms of the total production for the average in the last 10 years, 
Uh, this is a, uh, a figure from our Philippine Statistics Authority. Uh, when we include uh, include seaweeds, because uh, uh, seaweeds is a significant uh, proportion of the fisheries production in the Philippines, that is uh, uh, around 1.5 uh, 1, yeah 1 1.5 million metric tons annually. So if you include that, uh, the uh, the contribution of uh, aquaculture because uh, uh, seaweeds is part of aquaculture. It uh, it uh, contributes 53 percent, and the municipal or uh, or the small scale just 21 uh, percent. But uh, if you uh, exclude the seaweeds, the um, the proportion or the contribution of the municipal or small scale uh, fisheries is around 33 percent, which is almost the same with that of the commercial or the industrial fisheries. Uh, just to show that the trends in terms of uh, the uh, production of the uh, uh, commercial and municipal, uh, it's in the last uh, last 10 years, it's almost level off or uh, from uh, 2011 to uh, uh, 2015, it was reducing from uh, uh, 2.5 uh, to around uh, uh, just above 1 million metric tons and level off to the previous, to the recent five years. Uh, and uh, again, to emphasize just in terms of the difference between the uh, species group by the two subsectors, the, the uh, commercial and the municipal or the small scale, um, just to emphasize, uh, for example, on uh, the uh, oceanic tunas and the small pelagic tunas are mainly contributed by the uh, commercial sector in the Philippines and the demersal and other uh, species are the municipal. But if you look at the small pelagics. The small pelagics are basically coastal resources, and uh, uh, coastal areas are basically the municipal waters. Are uh, um, small scale municipal are given the by by law they are given the priority uh, for these resources in coastal and municipal or coastal or, or municipal waters. So it is it is if you can see while uh, the uh, the uh, small pelagics are in the coastal areas the uh, production contributed by the municipal sector is only less than is only is not the majority or the big uh, portion of this uh, production which is which basically is the the main uh, i mean uh, the basis of uh, uh, of fish production for uh, local consumption the small pelagics uh, again uh, similar to uh, a uh, a world uh, view on uh, the small scale fisheries uh, the artisanal small fishers in the Philippines are considered uh, below the poverty threshold. So this is a uh, uh, an issue in the Philippines and higher high level of, in, of poverty incidence. And uh, as you can see, uh, the the last uh, 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 figure that we had in 2018 per capita income of this uh, sector is only about uh, is below the poverty threshold of around. Uh, 10,957. So that's around 209 uh, uh, US dollars, basically. So what are the challenges and uh, issues and concern in this sector? Uh, we have the limited capacity or like low technology. I think uh, this is how, why are we celebrating for the IAFA, the, for them being traditional and, uh, and small scale. So, uh, but basically these are uh, challenges for the sector. For them to uh, uh, to be more uh, to uh, to uh, to improve their uh, their uh, capacity and uh, socioeconomic conditions, uh, climate change. Uh, again, uh, this are this is the sector that uh, easily uh, affected by strong typhoons, uh, especially with uh, them being using only three gross tons and below. So, especially the Philippines is faced in the Pacific the, uh, Pacific and the and the West Philippine Sea, where these uh, uh, strong typhoons and uh, inclement weathers are really affecting the small scale uh, uh, sector. Uh, change in oceanographic conditions like uh, uh, El Nino and La Nina. Although uh, uh, usually uh, uh, we have observed that uh, uh, during the uh, El Nino season, these are also uh, seasons for high productivity for small pelagics. And of course, there are the uh, the pervasive resource use competitions, as I was saying, 
while the small pelagics is in the coastal waters, you can see the larger bear cells, commercial bear cells are producing more than, than the small scale. So that's basically uh, uh, the resource competition there. And some areas overfished and a displacement due to development activities like uh, 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 costa in coastal areas, like uh, uh, in, 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 in some areas. Uh, uh, and uh, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and, to access, and access to finances and financial institutions. So, but again, in the Philippines, the, uh, the artisanal small-scale municipal fishers are guaranteed with the protection of their rights in terms of, uh, of their preferential use in communal marine and fishing resources, both inland and, uh, and offshore. This is guaranteed by the Philippine Constitution of 1987. Uh, and it also guarantees uh, support to be given to them, uh, the fishermen, through uh, technology research, adequate financial and production, uh, and marketing assistance and other services. This is guaranteed in the Philippine Constitution. And in the amended fisheries code, uh, it is also a declared policy of the state in protecting the rights of this fisher folk, the small scale fisher folk, uh, with the priority to municipal fisher folk in the preferential use of the coastal municipal waters. Uh, similar to the constitution, uh, uh, they are uh, to be given uh, preference support in terms of uh, technology, uh, financial, and production support. And that. so, uh, as well as the importance of this sector is already recognized in, in some of our national management plans. So, for example, we have the National Tuna Management Plan and the Sardine Management Plan, where actions are there. Uh, prioritizing or giving action to giving equitable access of the uh, sustenance and municipal fishers uh, to these resources. Uh, that's basically how uh, we have uh, institutionalized empowering municipal fisher folks uh, through our fisheries and aquatic resources management council. Uh, in, uh, in our amended fisheries co code, uh, it already institutionalized the role of fisher folk in terms of planning and formulation of policies and programs for, for the fisheries. Uh, at different levels already, we almost have all the LGUs, local government units have uh, uh, their local uh, pharmacies in place, as well as the national uh, pharmacy, which uh, provides uh, 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 recommendatory and advice to the national uh, uh, government in terms of uh, the programs and policies at the national level. Uh, and lately in 2019, as I was uh, deeply involved in this effort, we have passed the uh, establishment of the fisheries management area, meaning uh, we have established the uh, 12 FMAs based on stocks and uh, fisheries delineation. Uh, 12 FMAs, it's already considered as a new era of fisheries management in the Philippines using uh, 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 strengthening uh, science-based uh, participatory and, uh, and transparent governance of, the, of uh, fisheries. Uh, it all, it, this is also a, uh, a true uh, devolution at the FMA level, meaning uh, policy and governance of these uh, fisheries at FMA level is already delegated to the to FMA level. So at the FMA, uh, the management bodies are there. So meaning uh, this is a, a very uh, representative uh, form of, uh, of management uh, where the sectors are represented in that management body, including the municipal and small scale fisher folk and other uh, stakeholders as well, as well as the science advisory group. Basically, the management body is the uh, policy making of that uh, FMA and the science advisory group uh, provides the science as a basis for policies and programs. And even at the science advisory group, there is this representation of the small scale uh, fisher folk uh, as part of this, uh, uh, of this uh, strengthening participation of, of the sector, uh, even using traditional uh, inform, uh, data and knowledge uh, as part of this governance, governance mechanism. As an update of the implementation of the business management areas, uh, we have already established the 12 management boards in the 12 FMAs and uh, 12 uh, scientific advisory groups 
as well as we have in this we have actually seven fmas doing now their fma efm plans basically efm plans for each of the fmas and uh, as i was saying i think uh, that the government through bpar has been providing support to fish uh, small scale fishers through uh, through inputs on uh, fishing bankas and so on but uh, of late we realized that while uh, while maintaining their support in terms of the sizes of three point we realized as well that uh, perhaps we need to upscale as well their capacity in terms of how they participate in the fisheries for example as i was saying how they should participate in in uh, as a ben to benefit them of of the resources that they have in municipal coastal water so we have been uh, we have piloted this uh, uh, providing them with uh, a bigger platforms and uh, uh, and a, a more uh, advanced technologies in terms of uh, to capacitate them to part to better participate in the fisheries, uh, providing them with bigger boats. So it's basically a uh, a uh, pilot uh, organizing these small fishers because if they are become always individual, they they it is observed. Uh, it, it is the view that they we will per, they will be perpetuated as a small. So we are trying to organize them as a group and as a cooperative and organized association for them to be able to uh, uh, to uh, for, the, for us to be able to uh, to prove the, to uh, to uh, to demonstrate uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, way of uh, capacitating whether uh, we have to prove to prove this. Uh, this uh, system as to uh, they should be uh, better uh, participate in the fisheries. Uh, again, as I was saying, uh, uh, these are actions that are already uh, identified in some of the management plans, as well as in the programs of BIFAR, uh, priority programs of BIFAR. Uh, those are, as I was saying, uh, providing them with, uh, with uh, exclusive areas for for example, tuna conservation management zone, providing them exclusive areas for small scale fisheries in terms of uh, participating in tuna, tuna fisheries. Uh, we also have this program in terms of the fisher scholarship program for fisher folk uh, and uh, IPs, the, uh, the uh, uh, indigenous peoples and their dependents. Uh, the BFAR has been sponsoring by region, we have 15, 15, 16 regions in the Philippines. We by uh, its region have provides 26, 26 scholarship to children of this fisher folk for its region. So uh, basically, this uh, this way of supporting the uh, to Im to improve their uh, their uh, socioeconomic conditions as well uh, in giving uh, support to their children to to be more to uh, to uh, to school scholarship until college. In the college, uh, uh, just recently, because of the issue uh, of the problem on uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, there was a sort of a government program in providing them with cash and uh, food subsidy for these marginal fa fa farmers and fishers, uh, providing them with uh, foods and uh, cash uh, assistance uh, during this uh, pandemic, as well as recently because of the uh, effect of the Russia Ukraine conflict uh, there was sort of uh, uh, fuel support for them in terms of uh, but uh, of course uh, these are minimal and uh, as the government um, uh, support to to this piece of work. Uh, as uh, I was saying uh, the Philippines is also preparing for a national celebration for the uh, international year of the uh, artisanal and fisher and uh, fisheries and aquaculture we started in december we worked with uh, our stakeholders and partners uh, before the uh, we are the uh, uh, fao as well fao philippines rare and the national anti uh, national anti poverty commission of the philippines we work with uh, we are this uh, these agencies and groups working together and we started in December 2021, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, we we intend to have a uh, a uh, report on the Philippine status of artisanal fisheries 
uh, working with the FISA folk on uh, what is now their, their uh, status now. And uh, uh, we have consultations and in, in preparation for this, uh, for, for example, uh, this April, we will have consultations and the report. And we have the uh, uh, annual celebration of Fisher Folk Month uh, annually. We, we celebrate it uh, annually in May. And we all the activities uh, will be aligned with the IAFA 2022 in the Philippines. Uh, during this month, we, uh, we appoint uh, Fisher Folk direct Director in all the regions uh, during the month of May, the whole month of May. All regions have their Fisher Folk Director as well as National Director for Fisheries at the national level. Uh, Fisher Folk uh, Director. So that's basically how we uh, we uh, give importance to our Fisher Folk uh, uh, in, in in the Philippines. And uh, we intend that on May 31, 2022, we launch this final report of the Philippine status of artisanal fish as a Fisher Folk Day in the Philippines. So uh, as a uh, as a summary, in summary, uh, why we are going, uh, we are celebrating Yapa 2022. I've been, uh, it's been uh, mentioned in, in the uh, uh, speakers earlier. Uh, we are uh, recognizing the importance of this sector in terms of their important contribution to fisheries production and food security. And uh, while they are uh, simple, traditional, this is their fish, they, this is their life and only source of living. And usually their fishing is more sustainable. And we would like as well to highlight that we take care of them. Uh, their needs are priority as provided for in in uh, in uh, in the law, and uh, we the importance of multi-sectoral support and collaboration among various stakeholders like uh, the government, regional, and international organization, the uh, civil society organization, and NGOs, the private sector are really important in progressing, uh, in progressing and ups and improving the uh, the status of. Uh, this is small uh, artisanal fisheries. And uh, we also recognize that fishers' participation in all levels of policy making, governance, and management, fisheries management, is vital to sustainability and effective implementation of programs and uh, policies. So, with that, uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon again to everyone. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you very much for sharing us the situation in the Philippines. So, let us move on. Uh, with the presentation uh, of the illuminating hidden harvest study on small-scale fisheries to be presented by Nicole, Nicole France. Nicole, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. And thanks for inviting me to this, uh, to this launch event for the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture for Asia. So, I will share with you some findings or some results of the so-called illuminating hidden harvest study, which is a collaboration between FAO, Duke University, and World Fish. And in short, we refer to this study as, as IHH, and we're aiming to look at the contributions of small-scale fisheries to sustainable development. So this IHH study really looks at the contributions of small scale fisheries to sustainable development in line with the sustainable development goals, but also in the context of the implementation of the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fisheries that were mentioned by other speakers before. So to do this, we conducted 58 country and territory case studies, and a lot of them in Asia and in the Pacific, as you can see, from the list here. In addition to the country case studies, we also used an ad hoc questionnaire on small scale fisheries that was sent out to FAO member countries and for which we received 104 responses. And we also looked at existing global and regional databases to complement this data that we have collected at the country level and through these uh, questionnaires. And lastly, we also conducted a number of thematic studies to highlight issues that are difficult to quantify at the global level. So with the illuminating hidden harvest study, we're trying to answer some questions and I'm sharing some of them here, starting with 
how much fish comes from small scale fisheries. With the hidden harvest study, we estimated that at least 40% of the global fish catch is coming from small scale fisheries. And in fact, small scale fisheries account for 47% and for 31% of the total catch in Asia and in the Pacific respectively. And in absolute terms, the production volume from small scale fisheries is highest in Asia compared to other regions of, of the world. It is also important to know that almost 34% of the catch in Asia is actually from inland fisheries, while it only accounts for 5% in, in the Pacific. So let's now look at the people behind this catch. According to, to our uh, estimates, about 60 million people are employed in small scale fisheries value chains. And again, the bulk of them is uh, based in Asia. And this confirms that small scale fisheries account for about 90% of employment along capture fisheries value chains. Importantly though, an additional 53 million people engage in subsistence activities. Um, here it says fishing, but it's actually both it's harvesting and also post-harvest activities. And these people in, that are either employed or engaging in subsistence are estimated to have 379 million additional household members. So if we add all of this up, it means that almost 500 million people depend at least partially upon small scale fisheries for their livelihoods. In terms of economic value, the average annual total revenues of small scale fisheries were estimated in our study to be around 77 billion US dollars. Of these, 58 billion US dollars are from marine catch and 19 billion US dollars from inland. So this places small scale fisheries among the largest industries of the ocean economy. Now, looking at that, we are moving on how do women contribute to and benefit from small scale fisheries. It's estimated that about 45 million women participate in small scale fisheries globally. So that means that for every 10 people in small scale fisheries, four are women either working for pay, so being employed, or fishing for home consumption. About half of these women engage in post-harvest activities. In fact, if, if we break it down, uh, we learn that women represent about 15% of all of those operating in pre-harvest activities, such as net making or, or preparation of, of of inputs for fishing, that about 19% of those that are engaging directly in commercial harvesting are women. And as said, said before, about 50% are operating in the post-harvest sector. And in addition, women account for 45% of the people engaging in small-scale fishery subsistence activities. So let's now see how small scale fisheries contributes to nutrition. All fish obviously provides diversity of nutrients, but the different species are providing obviously different com combinations of these nutrients. Um, and we found that small pelagic species have the best diversity of nutrients and are often also the most available and affordable fish to rural populations. And small scale fisheries actually contribute a large amount of that catch um, of the small pelagic species. So what we did, we used available data to generate predictions of nutrient values of different species of fish. And we estimated the regional nutrient yields of small scale fisheries catch expressed as a number of people for whom small scale fisheries catch could meet the recommended nutrient intakes. And according to that, we found that small scale fisheries catch 
could provide 987 million women globally with 50% of the recommended daily intake of omega-3 fatty acids. We also can look at that from a regional perspective. And for example, 277 million women in Asia could be supplied with the four most abundant nutrients uh, from, from small scale fisheries catch. So to maintain and build these critical nutrition functions of small scale fisheries, they obviously need to be considered also in fisheries management approaches. And that means that we need to look at governance of small scale fisheries. So to look into that, we try to understand the relevance of policies in terms of the catch that such policies influence by looking at the amount of catch under co-management provisions. And by doing that, we found that of every 10 tons of small scale fisheries catch, four of them are formally under, under co-management arrangements. We also found, found that for two tons, experts confirmed a perception of a high participation of fishers in the management process. So for every 10 tons, there are four which are formally under a co-management provision and two tons where the implementation of these provisions on the ground is actually supposed to, to really happen with the full involvement of the fishers. So this was only one example of the many existing and possible connections that really illuminate the contribution of small scale fisheries to sustainable development. And further exploring these connections will help us to reshape the narrative around small scale fisheries and also obviously related policy recommendations and decisions. I conclude by inviting you to look at the infographic of these findings from the Illuminating Hidden Harvest study that I just shared, which you can find on our FAO website. And I also hope that the event today inspires all of you to take action in support of small scale fisheries during this very unique international year. It will stimulate all stakeholders to act in support of small scale fishers, their lives and livelihoods. So let us move on to Panitnard Wirawat, who will tell us about the regional activities on small scale fisheries by the Southeast Asian Fisheries Development Center or CIFDEC. Panitnard, you have the floor. Okay, now, may I start? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. My name is Panina Virawat. I work at the CPEC training department as a senior instructor. It is a great honor for me to present the CPEC original activities on small scale fishery. Next, please. Okay. Uh, with the mission to promote and facilitate concert actions among the member countries, to ensure the sustainability of fisheries and aquaculture in Southeast Asia, which adopted in 2017 by CPLEC Council. Our CPLEC programs and projects have been initialed and implemented toward achieving this mission. Sustainable small scale fishery is also one of the main programs that CPLEC set as a high priority. More than two decades that CPLEC has been supporting the member countries in the implementation of several initiatives to promote sustainable small scale fishery. Initially, uh, CPLEC support on the regionalizations and implementations of the course of conduct for responsible fishery stating the characteristic of the tropicals and diversity of small scale fisheries in the region. Several regional guidelines, tools, fishing techniques, and practices then has been developed in close collaboration with ASEAN member, ASEAN CPLEC member country, collaborative partner, and organizations, which includes the regional guidelines, for responsible fisheries in Southeast Asia, 
also the core management using group user lines for small scale fisheries. CITEC, in collaboration with ASEAN member states, developed the ASEAN CITEC resolution and plan of actions on sustainable fishery for food security for the ASEAN Regional Travel 2030 and also clearly emphasize on supporting of the implementations of SSS guidelines. Next, please. Showing in the slides is a series of the meetings and workshops as implemented by CBEC in supporting the SSF guidelines. Since FIO has endorsed the SSF guideline in 2014, the SSF guideline was increased and attention as a major source of reference for the promotion of sustainable small scale fisheries to the organizations of a sequence of regional meetings. The first regional workshop was organized in 2015 in Bali, Indonesia, acknowledged the importance of the SSF guidelines and provide way forward on effective implementations of the SSF guidelines. In 2016, CIPTEC succeeds in developing the regional approach to implementing the SSF guidelines in the Southeast Asian region to consultation process at the regional technical consultation. We also receive a set of recommendations on the awareness rising activities, material and refer to the SSF guideline for further formulations of capacity development program at regional levels. In 2017, CIPDEC organized the expert workshop on regional approach for the implementation of SSF guidelines as a human life-based approach and gender equitability. As a result from this workshop, CPEC developed the policy brief on applying human life-based and gender equality approach to small-scale fishery in Southeast Asia. Next, please. In 2018 and 2019, CIPDEC organized the expert consultation to develop the practical guide for gender analysis in small scale fisheries and aquacultures in Southeast Asia. The final draft of practical guide was launched in 2020 to facilitate the conduct of gender analysis with a view of obtaining successful gender mainstreaming in programs and projects. The framework of the technical guide was structured in accordance with the thematic areas of the SSF guidelines. The SSF guidelines recommend that gender mainstreaming should be an integral part of our small scale fishery development strategy, considering the different cultural contexts. In 2020, CPEC and FAO have agreed to conduct the project on gender dimension in the YU chain of small scale fisheries and aquaculture in Southeast Asia to improve and strengthen gender dimension in selected small scale fisheries and aquaculture YU chain in Southeast Asia. Currently, small scale fisher, fisher worker, feed workers, and also their communities are facing the threats of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is affecting the entire value chain and the livelihood depending on it. For your information, CIPDEC organized a webinar on the impact of COVID-19 in fisheries and aquaculture, which you can find more information related to small-scale fisheries and other sectors through CIPDEC website. Next, please. For some of our part are programs on small scale fisheries, training departments continue the promotion of several concepts and management tools to secure and realize the importance of small scale fisheries in our borders, coastal, and marine resort management and development, which includes the human resource development program, such as the library management and co-management, integrate coastal resort management, locally based coastal resort management, 
cost of fishery management and ecosystem approach to fishery management. During 2014 to 2021, TD had trained more than 445 fishery officers to the uh, 20 e EFM training course and about 90% who compete the EEFM course have been competed the EAFM training of the trainer course. Besides, allowed 80 decision makers have been trained to the three lead EFM training course. Next, please. Aside to build and strengthen human capability on the concept and management tool to the SRD program, CPEC also support member country to apply the concept and approach to the implementation activity. As since 2017, the learning side of EAFM implementation has been carried out in several pilot projects. These to promote the EFM implementation. The learning sites are in Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, PDR, and Thailand. For the case of Thailand, from one pilot learning site of Ban Nai Nang of Gabi province, right now in collaboration with DOF of Thailand and other organizations, the EFM plan for every district of Gabi province was already developed as a framework and approach expansion. There was also the sub-project of facilitating fishery activity information gathering to introduction of community-based resource management and co-management. The project mainly focused on the promotion of CBIMs and co-management approach in CPEC member countries by implementing the project at the local level to strengthen CBIM and co-management, enhance participation of men and women, and promote alternative livelihood program in the fishing community. In addition, the officially data collection activity was conducted with local participa participation and the result of data collection could support for appropriate fishery management implementation. There were the pilot project learning sites in Thailand, La PDR, and also Cambodia. Next, please. For the resource enhancement, CPEC MFRDMD has successfully completed a study on construction and set up doable fit aggregating device for coastal fishery in CPEC member countries. It provides a more stable and dependable and least ecosystem for fishers to exploit fishery resources. A book entitled A Guide to Make and Set Doable Artificial Leaf Aggregating Device for Coastal Area was published in 2004. Also, in promotion of sustainable fishery resort enhancement measures in critical habitat and fishing ground in Southeast Asia, the project implemented activities on the enhancement of bull swimming crab fishery for sustainable management of the bull swimming crab fishery in Cap Province of Cambodia. The official carry out the cap bank activities by using co-management efforts. The activity also includes establishment of hatchery system and establishment of conservation zone. In addition, TD conduct the project on the introduction of set net fishing to develop sustainable cost of fishery management in Southeast Asia at the case study in Thailand in 2003. The project receive positive feedback on the function of fishing gear, resource enhancement aspect, fisher cooperation, and also environmental protection. Next, please. Lastly, enhancing cost of community resilience for sustainable livelihood and cost of resource management operated by MFRDMD. This project was funded by Islamic Development Bank, which aimed to improve the socioeconomic status of the Muslim community in the coastal area of Brunei Darussalam, Indonesia, and Malaysia. The project built capacity on the sustainable livelihood and coastal resort to the water training cost 
focusing on the alternative job. This project was successfully provided additional income to the community. For more information, you can visit our website recreated by the CIPDEC MFRDND. Next, please. Next is the CIPDEC ongoing programs on small scale fishery. Next, please. Showing in the slides is the ongoing CIPDEC programs on small scale fisheries composing of two projects. Firstly, if the small scale fishery management for better livelihood and fishery resource, which is supported by the Japanese Tat Fund, the project aims to work toward the sustainable management of small scale fisheries for improving the livelihoods and well being of fishers in Southeast Asia. There are the main components of activity, such as strengthen human capability on sustainable small scale fishery. Implement the EFM in the pilot learning size, also in line with the implementation of SSF guidelines in Southeast Asia. The project focuses on fishery social economic assistance, such as microfinance, credit, and insurance, including the enhancing the livelihoods and well being of small scale fishers, as well as promotion, gender integration, and empowerment. Next, please. Secondly, the project on gender dimension in the value chain of small scale fisheries and aquaculture in Southeast Asia. In 2019, CIPDEC developed the practical guide for gender analysis in small scale fishery and aquaculture in Southeast Asia based on the SSF guideline and a framework. This guide is expected to be used for assessment of gender dimension in small scale fisheries and aquacultures at the result could provide as baseline information for fishery management and project planning for better understanding of the status of women and men in small scale fisheries and aquaculture while you train. FAO in collaboration with CPEC is undertaking a survey for assessment of gender dimension in the value chain of small scale fishery and aquaculture in four countries, namely Lao PDR, Myanmar, Thailand, and the Philippines. The expected outcome from the assessment would be improving and strengthening gender dimension in small scale fisheries and aquaculture value chain in selected community in Southeast Asia. The expected output of the study is a report of gender dimension in the small scale fisheries and aquaculture value chain that can be used as a basis for field uh, interventions and a communication product conveying the good practices of gender in fishery. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your high attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Panit Nard, for uh, that uh, showing us the breadth of the activities uh, of CIFDEC on uh, small scale fisheries. Um, so it is time for Q&A. We have a brief time uh, for, for Q&A. But before that, I would like to ask Sherlene, uh, Sherlene, please clarify uh, the question regarding the uh, certificate so that everybody is uh, clear on that. Please, over to you, Sherlene. Thank you, Susanna. Yeah, just as we mentioned yesterday, uh, unfortunately, we will not be uh, distributing any certificates for this webinar because this is not a uh, not a formal uh, course based uh, webinar. So it's just for everyone to uh, be informed and uh, on the developments that we are doing for this um, celebration. And also just to let everybody know again that uh, this uh, meeting is being recorded and it will be available on InfoFish YouTube channel. Uh, it's also being live streamed right now. Thank you, Susanna. Okay, so we have five minutes uh, before closing. And uh, we use, I don't see any question right now. So we will use these five minutes to go around. I will start in the order that we have with the speakers. And just to tell us three words that you think of 
when EAFA 2022 is mentioned, okay? Three words, no, no uh, phrase. So what, what comes to mind? What three words come to mind when you think of uh, IAFA 2022? Okay, game. Simon. <laughs> uh, resilience um, and respect for, for the sector and hope for the future. Wow. Okay, Sebastian. Well, I would say that uh, carbon friendly, equitable and sustainable fisheries. That is wow. the message, yeah. That's the that clear message. Okay, who's next? Uh, Habibur. Habibur. Three yes, words. Uh, so I like the countries should celebrate the program also, like Bangladesh. <laughs> Locally, we should do something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, next, next uh, to Habibur is Rafi. Are you there, Rafi? What three words come to mind? Yes, yes, thank you, Mam Susan. The three words in mind, I would say uh, resilient. The, oh. the next word is capacity. They need capacitating. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third probably, uh, priority. They, they, oh. they should be given priority. Thank you. Okay. Nicole. Thank you. What comes to mind is empowerment, political will, and a huge opportunity for action for all. Panit Nard. Thank you for my achievements of the uh, uh, important of the small scale fisheries and we really have to work together uh, for the human uh, capacities and cook up for the resilience, uh, work for the resilience for better life food for the for our people that can be very by of our future. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to give a chance to Sherlene. <laughs> Sherlene. Thanks, Susanna. Uh... I, I would agree with capacity building, mm -hmm. resilience, and uh, this thing is always in my mind, uh, the unsung heroes. Wow, okay. Uh, so thank you very much uh, everyone for that, very quick, and uh, sums up what we want to see uh, during this uh, international year. And uh, so, we only have two minutes and it's really time to wrap up our webinar. We don't, I know that um, all of you have uh, your own schedules or your own meetings to go to, but we hope that you have enjoyed the webinar as much as we did. It's very informative, a lot of information to digest, but also a lot of ideas uh, to stimulate your interest, to find out more about small scale fisheries and aquaculture in the region and initiate actions to improve the lives and livelihoods of all actors involved in the small scale fisheries and aquaculture value chains, as well as the resources and biodiversity on which they depend. So a big thank you to all our panelists, Simon, Sebastian, Habibur, Rafi, Nicole, and Panit Nard for being with us and to InfoFish colleagues for organizing the webinars. A big, big thank you also to RAP colleagues for the support and sincere thanks to all our participants in the two webinars.